ethics what is ethics and what are ethics maybe this is a discussion on ethics ethics can also be known as moral philosophy and ethics is a branch of philosophy which seeks to address questions about morality that is about concepts like good and bad right and wrong justice virtue etc major branches of ethics include meta ethics about the theoretical meaning and reference of moral propositions and how their truth truth values if any may be determined that's meta ethics <coughs> theoretical meaning and reference of moral propositions and how their truth values may be determined normative ethics is about the practical means of determining a moral course of action norms are imposed so that's normative ethics about the practical means of determining a moral course of action applied ethics about how moral outcomes can be achieved in specific situations moral psychology about how moral capacity or moral agency develops and what its nature is and descriptive ethics about what moral val moral values people actually abide by that is descriptive ethics deals with uh, what moral values people actually abide by and within each of these branches are many different schools of thought and uh, still further sub fields of study now meta ethics is concerned primarily with the meaning of ethical judgments meaning of ethical judgments and uh, or prescriptions and with the notion of which properties if any are responsible for the truth or validity thereof so meta ethics is concerned with the meaning of ethical judgments and uh, uh, it deals with the properties uh, which are responsible for the truth or validity meta ethics is a discipline gained uh, which gained attention with g e moore's famous work principia ethica in 1903 in which moore first addressed what he referred to as the naturalistic fallacy moore's rebuttal of naturalis naturalistic ethics his open question argument uh, sparked an interest within the analytic branch of western philosophy to concern itself with second order questions about ethics specifically the semantics which is the meaning the epistemology and the ontology of ethics the semantics of ethics divides naturally into descriptivism and non-descriptivism descriptivism holds that ethical language including ethical commands and duties is a subdivision of descriptive language and has meaning in virtue of the same kind of properties as descriptive propositions non-descriptivism contends that ethical propositions are irreducible in the sense that their meaning cannot be explicated sufficiently in terms of descriptive truth conditions correspondingly the epistemology of ethics divides into cognitivism and non cognitivism a distinction that is often perceived as equivalent to that between descriptivists and non descriptivists non cognitivism non cognitivism may be understood as the claim that ethical claims reach beyond the scope of human cognition or as the weaker claim that uh, ethics is concerned with action rather than with knowledge cognitivism can there be seen as the claim that ethics is essentially concerned with judgments of the same kind as knowledge uh, knowledge judgments namely about matters of fact the ontology of ethics is concerned with the idea of value bearing properties that is the kind of things or stuffs that would correspond uh, correspond to or be referred to by ethical propositions non descriptivists and non cognitivists will generally tend to argue that ethics do not require a specific ontology since ethical propositions do not refer to objects in the same way that descriptive propositions do such a position may sometimes be called anti realist Uh, realists on the other hand are left uh, 
with having to explain what kind of entities, properties or states are relevant for ethics and why they have the normative status characteristic of ethics. Looking at uh, normative ethics, traditionally, uh, normative ethics, also known as moral theory, was the study of what makes actions right and wrong. These theories offered an overarching moral principle to which one could appeal in resolving difficult moral decisions. At the turn of the 20th century, moral theories became more complex and are no longer concerned solely with rightness and wrongness, but are interested in many different kinds of moral status. Uh, status. During the middle of the century, the study of normative ethics declined as metaethics grew in prominence. This focus on metaethics was in part caused by an intense linguistic focus in analytic philosophy and by the popularity of logical positivism. In 1971, John Rawls published A Theory of Justice, uh, noteworthy in its pursuit of moral arguments and eschewing of uh, metaethics. This publication set uh, the trend for renewed interest in normative ethics. Talking about Greek philosophy, Socrates, 469 BC to 399 BC, was one of the first Greek philosophers to encourage both scholars and the common citizens to turn their attention from the outside world to the condition of man. In this view, knowledge having a bearing on human life was placed as highest all other knowledge being secondary. Self-knowledge was considered necessary for success and inherently an essential good. A self-aware person will act completely within their capabilities to their pinnacle while an ignorant person will flounder and encounter difficulty. To Socrates, a person must become aware of every fact and its context relevant to his existence if he wishes to attain self-knowledge. He posited that people will naturally do what is good if they know what is right. Evil or bad actions are the result of ignorance. If a criminal were truly aware of the mental and spiritual consequences of his actions, he would neither commit nor even consider committing those actions. Any person who knows what is truly right will automatically do it according to Socrates. While he correlated knowledge with virtue, he similarly equated virtue with happiness. The truly wise man will know what is right, do what is good, and therefore be happy. Well, here of course Socrates is assuming a lot and ignoring probably the possibility that there are people uh, who derive pleasure out of uh, committing acts uh, which can be considered criminal. and. Uh, and they have no sense of compunction and any amount of uh, counseling uh, may not have any effect and the streak of violence and criminal behavior lies dormant in every human being uh, coming to aristotle uh, aristotle posited an ethical system that may be termed self realizationism self realizationism in Aristotle's view, when a person acts in accordance with his nature and realizes his full potential, he will do good and be content. At birth, the baby is not a person but a potential person. In order to become a real person, the child's inherent potential must be realized. Unhappiness and frustration are caused by the unrealized potential of a person, leading to failed goals and a poor life. Aristotle said, nothing uh, that nature does is in vain. Nature does nothing in vain. Therefore, it is imperative for persons to act in accordance with their nature and develop their latent talents in order to be content and complete. Happiness was held to be the ultimate goal. All other things such as civic life or wealth are merely means to an end. Self-realization, the awareness of one's nature and the development of one's talents is the surest path to happiness. Aristotle asserted that man had three natures the vegetable nature, the physical, the animal nature, that's the emotional, and the rational nature, which is the mental. Physical nature can be assuaged through exercise and care, emotional nature through indulgence of instinct and urges, and mental through human reasoning and developed potential. Rational development was considered the most important, 
as essential to philosophical self-awareness and as uniquely human. Moderation was encouraged with the extreme seen as degraded and immoral. For example, courage is the moderate virtue between the extremes of cowardice and recklessness. Man should not simply live but live well with conduct governed by moderate virtue. This is regarded as difficult as virtue denotes doing the right thing to the right person at the right time to the proper extent in the correct fashion and for the right reason. Now that's, that is something that needs to be cultivated over years of practice. And finally, hedonism uh, posits that the principal ethic is maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. There are several schools of hedonistic thought, ranging from those advocating the indulgence of even momentary desires to those teaching a pursuit of spiritual bliss. In their consideration of consequences, they range from those advocating self-gratification regardless of the pain and expense to others and to those stating that the most ethical pursuit maximizes pleasure and happiness for the most people. Cyreniac hedonism founded by Aristippus of Cyrene. Cyreniac supported immediate gratification. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Even fleeting desires should be indulged for fear the opportunity should be lost forever. There was little or no concern with the future, the present dominating in the pursuit for immediate pleasure. Cyreniac hedonism encouraged the pursuit of enjoyment and indulgence without hesitation, believing pleasure to be the only good. Epicureanism Epicurus rejected the extremism of the Cyreniacs and believed that some pleasures and indulgences to be detrimental to human beings. Epicureans observed that indiscriminate indulgence sometimes resulted in uh, negative consequences. Some experiences were therefore rejected out of hand and some unpleasant experiences endured in the present to ensure a better life in the future. The summum bonum or the greatest good, S-U-M-M-U-M-B-O-N-U-M, -M -M -M. the summum bonum or greatest good to Epicurus was prudence exercised through moderation and caution. Excessive indulgence can be destructive to pleasure and can, can, can even lead to pain. For example, eating one uh, food too often will cause a person to lose taste for it. Eating too much food at once will lead to discomfort and ill health. Pain and fear were to be avoided. Living was essentially good, barring pain and illness. Death was not to be feared. Fear was considered the source of most unhappiness and therefore conquering the fear of death would naturally lead to a happier life. Epicurus reasoned if there was an afterlife and immortality the fear of death was irrational. If there were no life after death then the person would not be alive to suffer. Fear or worry he then would be non-existent in death. It is irrational to fret over circumstances that do not exist such as one state in death in the absence of afterlife. Christian hedonism. Christian hedonism is a controversial Christian doctrine current in some evangelical circles, particularly those of the reformed tradition. The term was coined by reformed Baptist pastor John Piper in his 1986 book, Desiring God. Piper summarizes this philosophy of the Christian life as God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. This is the concept of Christian hedonism. Stoicism. S-T-O-I-C-I-S-M. The Stoic philosopher Epictetus, Epictetus posited that the greatest good was contentment and serenity. Peace of, <coughs> peace of mind was of the highest value. Self-mastery over one's desires and emotions leads to spiritual peace. The unconquerable will is central to his philosophy. The individual will should be independent and inviolate. Allowing a person to disturb the mental equilibrium is in essence offering yourself in slavery. 
if a person is free to anger you at will you have no control over your internal world and therefore no freedom freedom from material attachments is also necessary if a thing breaks the person should not be upset but realize it was a thing that could break similarly if something someone should die those close to them should hold to this to their serenity because the loved one was made of flesh and blood is destined to death flesh and blood destined to death stoic philosophy says to accept things that cannot be changed stoicism is about accepting things which cannot be changed resigning oneself to existence and enduring in a rational fashion death is not feared people do not lose their life but instead return for they are returning to god who initially gave what the person is as a person epictetus said difficult problems in life should not be avoided but rather embraced they are spiritual exercises needed for the health of the spirit just as physical exercise is required for the health of the body he also stated that sex and sexual desire are to be avoided as the greatest threat to the integrity and equilibrium of a man's mind abstinence is highly desirable epictetus also said remaining abstinent in the face of temptation was a victory for which a man could be proud modern ethics in the modern era ethical theories were generally divided between consequentialist theories of philosophers such as jeremy bentham and john stuart mill and deontological ethics as epitomized by the work of immanuel kant consequentialism consequentialism refers to those moral theories which hold that the consequences of a particular action form the basis for any valid moral judgment about that action thus uh, from a consequentialist standpoint a moral action a morally right action is one that produces a good outcome or consequence uh, this view can be expressed in the aphorism the ends justify the means but there are a lot of controversies here uh, the defining feature of consequentialistic uh, moral theories is the weight given to the consequence in evaluating the rightness and wrongness of action the consequence of an action or rule generally outweigh other considerations what sort of consequences count as good consequences who is the primary beneficiary of moral action how are the consequences judged and who judges them these are some questions that many consequentialist uh, theories address uh one way to divide various consequentialisms is by the types of consequence they are taken to matter most that is which consequences count as good states of affairs according to hedonistic utilitarianism a, a good action is one that results in an increase in pleasure and the best action is one that results in the most pleasure for the greatest number of people closely related is eudaimonic consequentialism uh eudom eudomonism means uh, seeking pleasure uh, happiness seeking happiness in fact closely related is eudomonic consequentialism according to which a full flourishing life which may or may not be the same as enjoying a great deal of pleasure is the ultimate aim similarly one might adopt an aesthetic consequentialism in which the ultimate aim is to produce beauty however one might fix uh, on non psychological goods as the relevant effect thus one might pursue an increase in material e- equality or political liberty instead of something like m- the more ephemeral pleasures other theories adopt a package of several goods all to be promoted equally whether a particular theory focuses on a single good or many conflicts and tensions between different good states of affairs are to be expected and must be adjudicated deontology deontological ethics or deontology is an approach to ethics that determines goodness or rightness from examining acts rather than third party consequences of the act as in consequentialism or the intentions of the person doing the act as in virtue ethics 
deontologists look at rules and duties for example the act may be considered the right thing to do even if it produces a bad consequence if it follows the rule that one should do unto others as they would have done unto them and even if the person who does the act lacks virtue and had a bad intention in doing the act eh, we have a duty to act in a way that does those things that are inherently good as acts or follow an objective objectively obligatory rule for deontologists the ends or consequences of our actions are not important in and of themselves and our intentions are not important in and of themselves immanuel kant's theory of ethics is considered deontological for several different reasons first kant argues that to act in a morally right way people must act from duty second kant argues that it was not the consequences of actions that make them right or wrong but the motives of the person who carries out that action the motive is important here Kant's argument that to act in the morally right way one must act from duty begins with an argument that the highest good must be both good in itself and good without qualification something is good in itself when it is intrinsically good and good without qualification when the addition of that thing never makes a situation ethically worse Kant then argues that those things that are usually thought to be good such as intelligence perseverance and pleasure fail to be either intrinsically good or good without qualification pleasure for example uh, pleasure appears to be not good without qualification because when people take pleasure in watching someone suffering this seems to make the situation ethically worse he concludes that there's only one thing that is truly good nothing in the world indeed nothing even beyond the world can possibly be conceived which could be called good without qualification except a good will postmodern ethics in the 20th century saw a remarkable expansion of critical theory and its um, evolution the earliest marxist theory created a paradigm for understanding the individual society the individual the society and uh, their interactions the renaissance enlightened man had persisted up until the industrial revolution when the romantic vision of noble action began to fade modernism exemplified in the exemplified in the literary works of virginia woolf and james joyce uh, wrote out god and then anti humanists uh, such as uh, uh, louis althusser and uh, michael foucault and other structuralists like roland barthes presided over the death of the author and man himself So you see, Jack uh, Derrida is also he argued reality in the linguistic realm, stating there is nothing outside the text. And others theorized that signs and symbols or simulacra had usurped reality, particularly in the consumer world. Post-structuralism and post-modernism are uh, both heavily theoretical and uh, follow a fragmented anti-authoritarian course, which is absorbed in narcissistic and uh, nihilistic. activities normative issues are generally ignored and uh, you have a whole range of theories so applied ethics when we talk about applied ethics it's a discipline of philosophy that attempts to apply ethical theory to real life situations the discipline has many specialized uh, fields such as bioethics and business ethics so applied ethics is used in some aspects of determining public policy is getting an abortion immoral is euthanasia immoral is affirmative action right or wrong what are human rights and how we de- how do we determine them do animals have rights so these are all coming under specific uh, applied ethics uh, discussions a more specific question could be if someone else can make better out of his or her life then i can is it then moral to sacrifice myself for them if needed without these questions there is no clear fulcrum on which to balance law politics and practice of arbitration in fact no common assumptions of all participants uh, so the ability to formulate the questions are prior to rights balancing 
but not all questions studied in applied ethics concern public policy. For example, making ethical judgments regarding questions such as is lying always wrong and if not, when is it permissible is uh, prior to any etiquette. People in general are more comfortable with dichotomies. However, in ethics the issues are most often multifaceted and the best proposed actions address many different areas concurrently. In ethical decisions the answer is almost never a yes or no, uh, yes or no or right or wrong statement. Many buttons are pushed so that the overall condition is improved and not to the benefit of any particular group or individual. We have uh, different fields of applications of ethics. Real, relational ethics related to the ethics of care. Uh, they are used in qualitative research, ethnography and autoethnography. Uh, they they are uh, they are concerned about uh, researchers and the communities in which they live and work. Uh, relational ethics also help researchers understand difficult issues such as conducting research on intimate others and that have died and developing friendships with their participants. Military ethics to guide members of the armed forces to act in a manner consistent with the values and standards as established by military tradition. Uh, justification for using force uh, and gender equality, age discrimination, nepotism, political influence. These are some ethical issues involving a country's military establishment. Moral psychology uh, is a field of study in both philosophy and psychology. And uh, the term moral psychology relatively is narrow uh, to, uh, and refers to the study of moral development. So how does morality develop in an individual? What are the stages involved? Evolutionary ethics concerns approaches to ethics based on the role of evolution in shaping human psychology and behavior. And descriptive ethics is a value free approach to ethics which examines ethics not from a top down a priori perspective but rather observations of actual choices made by moral agents in practice. And uh, these are um, some philosophers rely on descriptive ethics and choices made and unchallenged by a society or culture to derive categories which typically vary by context. This leads to situational ethics and situated ethics. So ethical codes, the study of descriptive ethics may include examinations of the following. Ethical codes applied by various groups. Some consider aesthetics itself the basis of ethics and a personal moral core developed through art and storytelling as very influential in one's later ethical, ethical choices. Informal theories of etiquette which tend to be less rigorous and more situational. Some consider etiquette a simple negative ethics that is where can one evade an uncomfortable uh, truth without doing wrong. One notable advocate of this view is Judith Martin Miss Manners. According to this view ethics is more a summary of common sense social decisions. And uh, descriptive ethics includes examinations of uh, in the practices of arbitration and law. Uh, the claim that ethics itself is a matter of balancing right versus right. That is putting priorities on two things that are both right. But which must be traded off carefully in each situation. Observed choices made by ordinary people without expert aid or advice. Who vote, buy and decide what is worth valuing. This is another major concern in descriptive ethics. Of course, sociology, political science and economics also examine similar topics.